Okay, hello, welcome. I'm told that we're live. Great. Welcome to this training stream for AIE Online. My name is Craig Bentick, and I'm looking forward to taking you on a little bit of a journey into creating your first rapid prototype in Unreal Engine 4, including some wicked destruction. Um, we'll be looking a little bit at blueprints, uh, bringing some assets in. Uh, I've sent a link to uh, Mick, who will post that in the chat, I think, to a Google Drive folder that has just a couple of static meshes that you guys can use if you want to follow along. Um, to start with, I just want to quickly mention, if you find yourself getting sore or wanting to get up and move around or step away from the computer during the session, please feel free to do so. Your health is more important than listening to me ramble on. Uh, we will be recording this session so you can access it later on and uh, catch up on anything you've missed. So we have a fair bit of ground to cover today, um, particularly if you're not familiar with Unreal Engine um, at this stage. So you may want to come back and refer to things uh, later on, but please do put your questions into the chat and uh, Mick will grab those and I will get to those at the end. If there are just anything burning, he'll get them to me um, during the session if I need to be told about that stuff. Um, so, what are, we, what are we looking at today? We're looking at indulging our most childish instincts, the most awesomest childish instincts that we have. We're going to create projectiles, a big gun, and some destruction. We're going to ruin the objects that we have in our game. So everybody loves breaking stuff. Um, we're, we're going to look at uh, the user interface in Unreal. We'll create a new project. We'll create a custom player so that you'll be set up to go and create your own interactions for your players in your games. We'll cover creating projectiles, controlling our character using different types of inputs. That's going to be a sort of an important notion for you to understand moving forward. We're going to create some destructible geometry and we're going to have some progressive destruction, which is going to be super exciting. Um, so we've, we've always loved smashing stuff since... Like, we were playing with Lego. I know I'm not alone in that. That's a universal thing. You build something great, and you want to see if it's got some structure to it. And really, we're going to indulge that childish instinct. Um, but in terms of gaming, there are really robust and kind of um, visceral way for people to kind of feel like they're a part of the environment of the game. Having things progressively break down or allowing them to affect their environment in that way has allowed for, you know, arguably a lot more immersive experiences for people. Now, you guys are so lucky, I sound like an old man with a cane waving at the sky just yelling about things because you guys have free access to tools like Unreal, which are so powerful and yet so simple in so many ways. They take away a lot of the complexity of doing these things and let you be creative in a way that you kind of want to, that empowers us. So the idea with this is going to be rapid prototyping, putting something together very quickly um, that demonstrates an idea rather than necessarily trying to create a full game by the end of the session. So it's important to kind of understand the concepts involved and how these tools can allow you to rapidly prototype your game concepts. All right, we're going to get to breaking some stuff. All right, let's do it. Okay, and I will close that down. Close that thing. All right, so what we've got here is the Unreal Project Browser, the launcher, um, will open up and give you access to the different engine versions that you have. You can simply click Launch uh, once you've downloaded and installed the engine and everything's disappeared. Come back, there we go. All right, come back, computer. So when we go to create a new project, we have several options. I'll make this a little bit larger. We've got a blank project. We've got some fantastic presets like first person mode, flying, third person for if you want to make a kind of GTA style game or something like that, top down, we've got vehicles, all that great stuff. For our purposes today, we're going to be creating a blank one because I want to cover you creating your own character, your own player, so that you're not necessarily relying on the ones that they provide and have a better understanding of how they work. So to start with, we can down here pick the target platform for our game. We either want it to be on a desktop or a console, which means that certain settings will be enabled or certain controls will come on screen if we set it to mobile. It'll give us some virtual joysticks and stuff. We're going to leave it there. We also then have the option to change the graphical quality of our project right from the outset. Now, maximum quality is great. It turns on all of the bells and whistles and lovely effects that the engine is capable of, but I always prefer to start with a scalable 3D project because 
We can always turn that stuff back on later if we need it. But sometimes, you know, it's important to be able to target the lowest end platform, particularly if you want to put a product out to people on, you know, phones or lower end PCs and that kind of a thing. So we'll select scalable 3D or 2D. And we've also got this starter content. They provide us some really cool stuff like prefab, like explosion particles, some geometry that we can work with, that kind of stuff. Again, I'm not actually going to bring that in because I want to have the most empty project I possibly can to, to start with. So let's call this um, our projectile underscore tutorial. And I will hit create project and it's going to carve out all of the folders and structures that it needs and set that project up for me. And we'll wait for the user interface to come up. Let's hope it's a little bit quicker this time than, um, than not quick. Here we go. All right. So now for a quick tour of the user interface. Okay. So this can be a little bit daunting at first because there's buttons everywhere. There's things everywhere. We don't know what, what's what. The first one we'll look at over here is the modes panel. This has a bunch of different tools in it to do with landscape and BSP brushes, which are like their primitive geometry that you can put in and stuff. But for the most part, this basic list is something that you might end up using. You can do things like add empty actors to the scene, things like a player start, which are really important that the engine uses to work out where is the player going to start. We can drag into the scene and create things like cubes and spheres and things like that if we need to sort of quickly build things out. And these are really powerful for rapid prototyping. The different categories have things like lights. Um, we've also got things for visual effects to be able to put things like fog and stuff in there. All kinds of really exciting stuff. We're probably not really going to be using that very much today because we're going to create our own actors. Down here we have the content browser and this represents all of the assets and uh, blueprints or classes, depending on how you want to talk about it, uh, that exist within the entire game. It's not content that is bound to the level you're currently working in. It's stuff that exists all over the place and you can access it from anywhere at any time. And that's where things like our meshes, our textures, any of the blueprints that we create, um, indeed the levels that we make, all of that kind of stuff will come in and be populated in this content browser. And it has like a folder structure over the left hand side here, and then it shows us the contents here on the right. So that's nice and powerful. Um, that's also the point at which we can apply what I call project hygiene. So keeping your folders structured properly is really important if you're working with other people. Um, uh, then we've got over here the details panel. This is really important. This is where when we select something in the level, it's going to show us all of the properties and all of the components that exist within that object. So here we've got the transform, which is a really important notion. Every object that exists within the world is going to have a transform. That means it has a location or position, a rotation and a scale. So no matter what you do, any object that exists in the level is going to have that. It doesn't necessarily have to have anything else. That's just its core component, its root component. So as we go through and add more things in here, let's take the light source for example. We can do things like change the intensity of that light here with this slider. Um, we can change the color of it and make it a crazy color. Those are all things that we can do within the details inspector panel. Um, the other one that we have here is the world settings. You might not have this. You might need to go up to the window drop down and choose world settings. Um, this is something that we're going to use in a couple of minutes, but it's basically some overall settings for the level that you're working in at the moment. So it lets us do things like specify what type of player should appear in this level and other great stuff like that. Um, the world outliner up here is basically the hierarchy of objects that exist within our scene. We can see that it's got an atmospheric fog there, a floor object, a light source, and a player start object, and a sky sphere so that we can have nice clouds and beautiful sky and beautiful sun and all that good stuff. Cool. So, oh, and <laughs> it's pretty important for me to point this stuff out. Um, up here is where we can access some settings like project and world settings. Um, we can also access different blueprints from here, although I don't tend to use that a lot. The most important thing that we have up here is actually this play button. And if I hit this now, it's going to switch my game into play mode. And I can move around and do all of this good stuff and all that. So that's basically the default blank project that comes with the engine. We also have the ability, if we click on the little arrow next to it, to choose to play it in the viewport, to pop out a new window separate to the editor, or we can simulate it. 
which is really cool. If you need to see something that's going on in the level, but you can't really see it if you're the player, you can use Simulate. Right, so let's create our player. Um, first, we're going to need to create a new player blueprint. And what we will create is a pawn. So in our content browser, let's start by right-clicking and choosing new folder. And let's call this blueprints. This is where our blueprints are going to go. We can then right click in here and choose to create a new asset. We can do things like create materials, particle systems, um, all different types of sound items, just pretty much anything that we might want to create has a shortcut in here. So we're going to create a blueprint class. And then we have this list here, which can be kind of confusing at first. So the top one here is an actor. So that's basically the most primitive type of object that we can have. All it's going to contain is that transform. It's not going to have any functionality to move around or do anything exciting or anything like that. It's basically an empty game object. If you've been working in Unity, that's the terminology that we can use. That would be an empty game object that only had a transform. What we're going to choose is a pawn. So that's an actor that has the ability to be possessed by the player or an AI. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't have any built-in functionality. It's just something that we can grab and say, hey, I want control of you now. It could be a player. It could be a car. It could be a plane. It could be another character. It could be anything we want. Then we have the character preset, which is actually built in with a movement component that allows us to sort of have um, for third person and first person stuff. It just basically has some pre-built pre functionality to let us have it walk around or move at a certain speed and stuff like that. The other stuff we might cover in a minute, but I'm just going to create the first pawn. So that's created that in my blueprints folder and let's name it BP underscore player pawn. Awesome. So um, when we clicked on creating a blueprint class, you'll see that there was this one here for player controller. And that's actually a separate, that's essentially the soul of the player that um, uh, can, can, can possess and depossess different types of pawns. So if I had the cannon in there or I had a car in there, the player controller is actually the thing that takes possession of the cannon and then can take possession of the car. So that's, um, we're going to use the default one for now, but you would be able to create your own that was able to do things like store, you know, um, a player's score or something like that. You could do that that way. Okay, so what we can do now, so we've created our pawn. Um, now that we have that set up, we need some way to tell the engine that this is what we wanted to use. Right now, if we play, we're going to have this built-in thing that's not actually the thing that we've set up, and we don't necessarily want that. In order to do that, we're going to need to create a new game mode. It's a different type of blueprint that is essentially kind of the brain of the level that we're in at the moment. It works out what some of the default classes should be for things that we want to use. So if I right click in here, choose create basic blueprint class and choose game mode, it defines the game being played, its rules, scoring and other facets of the game type. So I'll create that and I'll call it BP Canon Game Mode. Beautiful. Let's crack that open and have a look at it. So this is presenting us with the blueprint editor. We don't actually need to do anything in here right now, but I wanted to give you guys a quick look because we'll be coming back in here in a moment. This has its own details panel on the right hand side here. And the most important thing that we care about right now is this default pawn class. If we look at this drop down on the right hand side, it's currently set to default pawn. If we drop that list down, this BP player pawn that we created is now in that list. So if I select that, I compile it and save it. And then I can close this tab down. And then in my world settings, I need to actually give the level this game mode to use. So I'll use this drop down and choose BP Canon Game Mode. If I expand the slot beneath selected game mode, I can see that it's now using BP Player Pawn as the default pawn class. And that's good news. We've created our own game mode. So let's hit play. And okay, so in contrast to how it was before, nothing's really happening. Um, our keyboard's not doing anything and our mouse is not doing anything. That's because we haven't set up any kind of input for the pawn. 
right now it's just an empty game object that we have possession of. We can't tell it to do anything. So the first thing that we'll want to do with our, because we're going to create a cannon, okay, that's essentially going to launch a cannonball at an object and progressively break it down and destroy it. So we could do this in a number of ways. We could directly intercept, say, the movement of the mouse and use that to control the rotation of our player. But that presents some potential issues. It's not always ideal because perhaps at a later point, you'll want to implement something like a gamepad instead. You want people to be able to play it on PC and console. So if you set your system up to be exclusive to the mouse and you set up specific references like that, you're kind of cutting yourself off at the knees there and you're going to have to go back and fix it up later on. So to counter this problem and increase the flexibility of our project, we're going to set up an input axis instead. So what we're going to do is we're going under settings, we'll choose project settings, and then in this massive crazy list of stuff on the slide here that's going to daunt and frighten you, we'll just select input and look at the first area up the top here, the bindings. So you'll see there are action mappings and axis mappings. An action mapping is a single binary event, such as a key press, a button, or a mouse click. So it's something that goes click, click, on, off, on, off. An axis mapping is appropriate for more analog values, like a trigger, a joystick, or in our case, a mouse axis. So right now, we have no mappings whatsoever. What we need to do is click on this add axis mapping button and expand the list out, and then expand that out, and we can see that we can give it a name and then from this drop down list we can choose what inputs we want to map to this uh, particular input so let's call this one uh, look up okay and in our case we're going to set that to be the mouse and look up is going to be the mouse Y. So you can see here in this list, we've got all kinds of stuff coming through. We've got all the different keys from the keyboard that we'd be able to add in there. We've also got the gamepad inputs, which is really handy. So we'll choose mouse Y, but let's also set it up for a gamepad as well. By clicking the add button on the actual access mapping, we can specify a secondary uh, input to also be able to change this lookup value. So let's say the right thumbstick Y axis, okay? Now we're gonna close that one down. We're going to add a second one, a second axis mapping, and we'll call it look right. And in this case, we're going to set that to be the mouse X, and let's make the gamepad one be the right thumbstick X axis. So we'll figure out if these actually are gonna work or if I've got everything backwards in a minute. Now that we've done that, we've added our inputs, we can actually um, we can actually test them out. Now there is one possibility here that I want to bring up just briefly with these inputs. If we expand this out, this lookup one, you'll see that any of these inputs have a scale value next to them. So if I were to set this mouse Y to say negative one, which I'm pretty sure I have to, that's going to invert the mouse. So you know in some FPS games you want to flip the mouse so that you push up and it looks up or looks down or whatever. Uh, that's a place that you can kind of set that globally for your project and then you'd add the options for the player to do it later on. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so we've got mouse wire. Da, 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 da. That should be good. What are we going to do next? Uh, oh, let's add one more input mapping, actually. So we'll go back into our project settings and we'll add an action mapping because we're going to need this eventually. And let's call this Fire! We need a way for us to be able to shoot our weapon. In this case, I'm going to set it to the left mouse button. And let's add in the gamepad. Oh, where's the trigger? Let's make it the right trigger. Okay, cool. So when I pull that trigger, it'll go pew, 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 pew. Awesome. Beautiful. Okay, so now let's crack open our pawn blueprint and actually start creating our first blueprint nodes. So... In our blueprint editor, we have a list of all of the components that are attached to this game object. Uh, we've got some different graphs that we can have a look at, some functions, and these variables, these are gonna be pretty important. This is where we can do things like set the amount of ammunition the player has, 
um, work out whether or not they can fire like different types of variables like yes, no, different types of numbers, that kind of thing. That's where we can store and pull things from. Um, we've also got the details on the side here, which is going to be context aware and the toolbar up the top that lets us compile and save and all that great stuff. In our event graph, this is where most of the power is going to take place. The graph here is going to represent the flow of functionality from an event, such as in this case, when the game begins, so begin play, we can drag off from this node here, this pin, and it gives us a context aware list of different things that we could have it do at that point. So let's say we want to play a sound when the game begins. We just type sound into this list and we've got a bunch of options like, you know, play sound at location. That could be a good one. Um, we've also got a bunch of other stuff that's to do with more arcane stuff or more, you know, complex functionality. But if we wanted to play a sound at a location, we click that and we can see that when the game begins, it's going to play a sound. We're not going to do that right now. Um, we've also got things like when the actor begins to overlap something else. And we've also got this tick one here, which essentially means that anything that we attach to this, like um, let's say spawn, spawn an actor from class. Okay. So that means that we can, you know, spawn something in the world. That's going to happen every single frame. The tick is basically your frame rate. So every frame, this thing is going to happen. So this is somewhere you don't want to put things that are heavy or complex or that don't really need to happen every single frame. So the nodes are connected by these wires uh, and variables can be connected in the same way. See, for instance, if I wanted to, um, uh, you know, plug, well, we wouldn't do this, but if I want to plug that in there, it's going to try and convert this to a location, but that's not a good idea. We'll get rid of that. So we can drag off the output arrow of a node and present it with the context sensitive list. We can drag off from variable, type, variable types um, and we can do things like math operations and stuff like that and pipe them out and pipe them back in and modify things. Oh, it's really, really cool. So the main ones that you're going to use um, are probably going to be begin play and event tick. So it runs the successive flow once every frame the game renders. So if it's 60 to 120 FPS, that's incredibly expensive. But let's get to setting up our mouse look. We have these events, but we don't necessarily want to check whether the players moved the mouse or anything when the game begins. Do we want to do it every frame? Well, we really only want to do it when the mouse changes. So if we right click in an empty space of the blueprint, we can start typing in what we called our inputs before. So I'll start typing in look, and we can see here that we've got axis events, and we can tell from that little icon that it's an event, look right and look up. We've also got axis values, which are a way for us to check what the values of an input are elsewhere in the flow. We're only interested in the events right now. So we'll right click and add look right, and we'll add look up. Brilliant. Okay, so so what do we got? We've got, we've got our look right and our look up. Okay, so if we drag off from the look right, what do we actually want to happen? Well, we kind of want the controller, the soul of this character, the thing that's pushing the pawn around to actually rotate in some way. So let's see what happens when we type controller. Okay, we've got all this crazy stuff. This is all very confusing. Okay, let's say, all right, here we go add controller your input and if we hover over this we can actually see what it's going to do adds an input affecting the your which is our left and right rotation to the controllers control rotation uh da -da 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 -da. okay add controller your input all right that's good now what we can do is actually take the value from that input which is going to be the mouse or the gamepad controller or whatever it may be and we're going to plug that straight into the value so we want the controller to rotate by as much as we're moving that stick or moving the mouse. Let's do the same thing for look up. We'll type controller. Let's see, what do we know about rotation? Well, roll is kind of side to side rotation. Pitch is up and down. So we probably want pitch. We'll plug that in there, the axis value. We've got the add controller pitch input. Now these events are only going to fire when the mouse moves, when we change it. So if we compile and save that, we can drag this and dock that tab to our main view. And if we hit play, 
All right, cool. We got our mouse looking around. That's awesome. Beautiful. Okay. So, what else do we need to do? Let's have a look here. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Here's one thing that we will need to do. If we select the pawn itself, we've got some class defaults and default settings. So, let's choose use controller in the class defaults tab, use controller rotation and use controller pitch. Okay, let's use controller rotation pitch. I'm not sure that we necessarily need to do that. Let's add a camera to this. So in this components list, we can add all kinds of crazy stuff. We can add meshes, we can add different shapes, we can add cameras, we can even add things to do with AI to get this to know what's happening at any given time. Um, but in our case, we're just going to add a camera to it. So that's fine, we can leave that there. And in this one, we want to tick Use Pawn Control Rotation. So I'll compile and save that. And now we can look around and that's all well and good. Right. So, let's, let's actually set up the projectile that we're going to want to shoot. Um, that seems like a pretty good point to go now. We've got our player, uh, we've got our game mode, we know it's being used. Let's create a new blueprint class. This time, rather than picking anything kind of interesting like game mode or pawn, we're going to just choose actor. We want this to be the most basic thing that we can. And let's call this BP underscore cannonball. Alright. We'll crack that open and have a look here. Now, what do we need this to do? Well, we probably need to have some kind of mesh to use for the projectile, but let's, let's get to that in a second. Under our components list, so where we can add things like lights and meshes and stuff like that. There are some really, really handy ones that have been created for us uh, by Epic and built into the engine, one of which is projectile movement. So we'll click that and it gets added. Now this is not something that has a location or a position or anything like that. It's basically a way to drive this object in the scene when it gets uh, created. So we have got an actor... We've got that da 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 da. We've got that perception. We're going to do this. Um, let's um, let's just create a normal sphere. Actually, we'll just click sphere, and that adds a mesh to this, uh, and that's all well and good. We've got that one. But see, one of the things with the projectiles is that this projectile movement is going to try and move the root component of this object, which at the moment <clears throat> is just a position in space. It's not actually this geometry. So what we can do is drag the sphere on top of the default scene root, and it will become the, the new root of this object. And the projectile movement moves up to the top because it's outside of that hierarchy. Let's make sure in the details of this object that we have uh, a collision preset set up. So let's make that a physics actor. That should be well and good. Make sure overlap events are there, and that should be pretty good. And we'll tick on generate hit events, so when it hits something, we're going to be able to hang off of that and go, hey, when you hit something, you know, do something like spawn an explosion or like scale yourself up or create a new light at this location or something crazy like that. And we've got our set self, uh, self set to physics actor, which is all well and good. And now we're going to need to adjust our projectile movement a little bit because this is going to basically... When this gets spawned, when we create this in the world, it's going to give it an initial speed, so a velocity for that bullet. If we look at the properties of that component, we can see that it's got an initial speed. We'll set that to something crazy like 2500. It's going to be awesome. And then we'll also tick should bounce. What that means is that when we launch it, it's going to bounce off of surfaces in the world and actually interact with the environment, which is really, really cool. So now our projectile will spawn with a set velocity. We need to handle what happens when it actually hits something. So with this sphere selected, let's go into the uh, properties for it and have a look down the bottom. So we already recognize this icon here as being an event. Uh, and a lot of these are really cool. They can be like when we've clicked the mouse or when our cursor goes over it or things like that. What we want is on component hit. So if we click that, blonk, 
it adds that to our event graph, which is, you know, the part where we actually create all of our functionality in our blueprints and we're ready to go. So now that we know when this happens, we can drag off and have certain things happen, which is awesome. So let's start by dragging off from the on component hit. So when the sphere hits something and let's see what we can do about some damage. So we'll just start typing damage in here and cool. We can apply some radial damage. That's going to be awesome. We hit that one and we've got our damage function. Okay, so we're going to need to specify some information for this to function properly. Um, this is going to generate a sphere of damage around the location that we specify here in the origin. But we can actually get a bunch of information from this event. So you see down the bottom here, we've got the other actor. So that's the actor that this sphere has hit. We've got another component that it hit. So if we needed to get something really specific from the actor that we hit, we could get that. We've got the impulse, which is like the velocity and the angle with which it hit that thing. We've also got this hit. So um, a hit is a what we call a structure. So it's basically a collection of different variables or different bits of information kind of clamped down into one kind of big list. So it can be a lot of different types of information. Um, things like the identity of the actors involved in the collision among others. So in order to access the information, we need to break this open. So down the bottom of this list here in context, we've got break, hit, result. Fantastic. Now, look at all the pins we've got, all the information. We've got the location that it happened, we've got the actor that it hit, all that great stuff, um, which is really useful. So this color coding on the different variables is really useful. We know that yellow is going to go with yellow. So if we look at the location that this impact happened, that's going to be the origin that we want to create that damage at. At the moment, this is probably the only thing we really need to plug in here. But let's set our base damage to 30. So it's going to do 30 units of damage and our radius to something like 250. So that's going to be cool. Um, so we've done our structure. We got that, 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 location. So yeah, that's all we really need to do. Now our damage will originate at the location that it hit the other object. Um, so we will also need to clean these objects up after they hit. Otherwise, we'll just have a world full of uh, cannonballs kicking around, which can get pretty nasty. So after it's applied the radial damage, so these are sequential. So it hits the thing, does the radial damage, and then we can drag off of here and decide how long we want this object to live before it just gets automatically cleaned up and destroyed. And we can do that with the lifespan uh, function. So we can choose set lifespan and um, let's say let's say we'll make it four seconds. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. What we could do here is actually give this a random number in between two ranges. Actually, I'm going to do that. If we drag off from one of these input pins, uh, we can give it a float value that we want to use. Just a number that we create out of thin air or a variable that's been created elsewhere over here on the side. I'm going to choose a random float in range. I'm going to set the minimum to four and the maximum to 10. What that means is that uh, when it goes to destroy these objects, it's going to wait a sort of random number in between 4 and 10 seconds. So that's good. So that's pretty much our cannonball ready. Um, we now have our projectile and we can handle what happens when it collides. We need a way to fire it. Okay, so let's do that in our player pawn where we've set up our controller inputs. Um, and we'll need to do what? We're going to need to work out when the player has fired or clicked the button. So thankfully, we created an event for that in the input manager earlier. So we've got the fire event that we can drop in there. And what do we want to do? When you press the button, let's spawn the bullet. So we'll type spawn, spawn actor from class. When we talk about a blueprint, we're really talking about a class which is a programming term for a, a class of object. Um, so we've got our fire, we're gonna spawn an actor, we need to choose the class that we want. And if we expand this list out, man, it's just full of, of everything that exists, you know, in the engine or in our project. We want BP Cannonball, okay? 
And we need to give it a transform it so it knows what to spawn and when to spawn it when I press the button. It just doesn't know where it needs to spawn it. So let's give it a transform. So let's actually give uh, our pawn another component that it can use for this transform. If we expand this list out, start typing arrow. And an arrow is just a simple object that we can use, uh, if we look in here, to move around as a child of the main object. So wherever the player goes, it's going to go. Um, to kind of set where we want the uh, cannonball to get launched from. So I'm going to get a bit crazy with it and give it a little bit of a rotation and move it sort of down and away from the camera a little bit so that it's kind of beneath us. And then I'm going to attach it to the camera. What that means is that wherever I rotate the camera, either up, down, left or right, all of that good stuff, it's going to go with it. Let's move it forward a little bit, compile and save that. Whoa! Yep, it's giving me an error because we're not providing a transform for this. But what we can do, now that we've created our arrow, we can drag this into our blueprint view and it can get that component for us. Now we have access to all of its properties, one of which will be its transform or its position, rotation and scale in the world. So if I choose get world transform, it's going to give me another one of these orange nodes and I can plug that straight into spawn transform, compile and save it. And now my cannonballs should be launching. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's test our game out. Let's test it. So if I hit play, I'm in my view. I can look around. Hey, hey, look at that. I can shoot my cannonballs. Whoa, and they bounce up if I shoot them at the ground. Boom, 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 boom. I can go absolutely crazy with it. Fantastic. Awesome. So that's how we create a really basic projectile. We can shoot our cannons to our heart's content. But that's, that's really only half the battle. The other battle is having something to actually destroy. So let's right click, create a new folder, we call it meshes. And then I'm going to import the asset that I provided to you guys for the rock wall. If I go to my export directory, that should be there. Rock wall mapped. So that's how we can bring an asset in. We just right click and choose import new asset. We'll give the rock wall mapped, leave all of this stuff as default, choose import all and bam, we've got a texture, we've got a material to be applied to the object and then the geometry itself. So if I drag this out into the world, it's a nice big rock wall, a bit hard to see in that light. There we go, that's all well and good. Uh, I'm going to switch to my scale tool and just make this floor quite a bit larger here. Move it out that way, and that should be good. So now, if I shoot, they'll bounce off it. All right, cool. So it really is as simple as that. It's automatically created collision for us, and uh, it's ready to roll. But we need to destroy it. So let's take this asset and right-click on it and choose from the top, Create Destructible Mesh. Ba-bam. It's created it, it's gonna have a think about it. And now let's drag that one that now has DM at the end of its name out into the world. We'll delete the old one and we will rotate it around and we'll put it here. Uh, and we're ready to go. So let's double click on the destructible mesh in the content browser and it'll give us a nice little preview of this here. This is where we can actually fracture this object. Um, all of these settings are ones that we're gonna have a look at in a second. But the important one is this cell site count. So it's how many chunks do you want this object to be uh, breaking into? I'm going to set it to a crazy 120. And then I'll hit this fracture mesh button. And it'll have a think about it. Ooh, it's going to think hard. Ooh, boo, 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 boo. Oh, and look at that. It's broken it up into all of these sweet chunks that we'll be able to use to destructify things. So we'll save that now. And we will need to set a few parameters in this panel here. And I'm just going to quickly run through what those are. The first thing we're going to do is enable impact damage. So that means damage rather than necessarily just taking damage from the radial damage that we're applying. But we can test it out without this first. Um, what else do we need? 
We also need accumulate damage, which means that certain parts of it will weaken first and break down rather than just hitting it and everything collapsing straight away. We'll choose world support so that if the object is overlapping any static objects in the world, chunks that are supported by that geometry are not going to fall away. So if you have a foundation for a building that needs to get smashed, it'll stay where it is and that will be all well and good. And this form extended structures is really cool because it means you can overlap multiple destructible objects and have them kind of function as one sort of structure. We'll set our support depth, which is the, the depth at which things should try and stick together to one. Because up here we've got preview depth zero, where there are no chunks at all before it's been fractured, and then preview depth one. So we want that to be the depth at which it is supported. And I suspect that that's going to be pretty much it. We've got a damage threshold, which is the damage that it needs to take before it's going to break. And then we've got the spread, which is how much damage one chunk is going to provide to the one next to it uh, before it breaks free. So let's save that and, and very much hope that uh, what I've done works. Let's hold Alt and move this object around to create a couple more. And we'll select them all and just sink them into the floor a little bit so that we get a little bit of that, uh, that damage that I was talking about. Okay, so we got that. If I launch that, oh. Boom, 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 boom. That thing just collapsed. It's exploded. It's broken. And this is really cool. Um, what I'll do briefly while we've got this is just go through that process one more time. Uh, I had a, another one in here, uh, building intact. Let's see what that's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll import all into this folder. Oh, it's giving me a message. And I'll drag this into my scene. So this is this is just a, a really rough piece of geometry that's supposed to kind of look a bit like a building. And I can right click and choose create destructible mesh on it. And then here's another cool trick with the destructible mesh selected and the one in your level selected. Right now it's using the static mesh. If you right click on something that's selected, you can actually replace it with whatever you have highlighted in the content browser. So I hit that one, and even though it looks the same, it's now a destructible actor. So I'll open up this one, and I'll set my cell count to something like 120 again. Um, make sure I've got accumulate damage, world support, extended structures, and support depth set to one. Those are the ones I'm pretty sure are the ones I need. And then I'm gonna fracture that mesh. Come on computer, keep up, keep up with it. Uh, I'm using, uh, oh, I just saw a question here. I'm using uh, uh, version 4.9.2, uh, but this stuff's been working for the last few revisions and, and definitely works in the newest versions, so you don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. We're, we're paddling in fairly shallow waters as far as the complexity of the, the engine goes. Um, and uh, do you need to use the event graph to add these functions? I'm not sure precisely what that question means. If you could maybe try rewording it for my, my brain to understand. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's see. We've got our building there. Oh, 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 it's starting to break free. Whoa, my building, the chunks came down. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's all collapsing. Uh, and see what's happening here is that these chunks are still physical objects. So they're actually preventing me from firing cannons at the building properly. I'll, can I hit that one? Oh, yeah, boy! <laughs> it's exploded! This is awesome. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to bring up another example that you might find kind of interesting. But in the meantime, if you'd like to know more about AIE Online or you have interest in what we've gone through today... Um, the contact details are there on the screen now. You can also get in touch with Mike Koo. He will be more than happy to help you. Um, and uh, we'll see uh, if we get a few more questions coming through. I'll be more than happy to answer those while I get this example happening. Um, okay, so this one here, let's see. Uh, we'll switch back to my screen share. And this is an example of this idea taken to a slightly different point. 
Uh, and this one is actually set up to be a little bit like a game. So there are... Oh, hang on. Let me do that one more time. We're on that. So there are some AI uh, enemies that are going to spawn in this world. You can see I've got a number of detained <laughs> prisoners. <laughs> I've got sounds going. <laughs> I've got... Escape! <laughs> So these prisoners are trying to get past me to escape. escape. So rather than destroying the structures, this is applying damage to my ragdolls. And if I hit the R key, I can go into bullet time and watch them go... Escape! No one escaped! Vunk! Escape! Escape! You can see there's some camera shake on this when I launch the cannon. That's a pretty simple effect. And I've also got some 3D user interface going on. Oh, what's that guy? Oh, look at he got owned! He's coming straight at me. Not the face! Ah! He gone crazy. Ooh. So these guys try and hide behind those pillars so that I can't hit them. Uh, but if I let go of the R key, everything ramps back to normal speed. Uh, escape! Yeah. This is crazy. Escape! It's too hard. Escape! Escape! But I do escape! like it when they go into bullet time. And it's cool because these are still all physically simulated. So that guy's... I fell down. And he's getting knocked by the other guy. He's kicking those bodies out of the way. Boom! He's going to fall right over my head. So this could be an interesting little VR game or something like that if you guys are into your Oculus Rifts and your, your Playstations and your Xboxes, things of that nature. So yeah, that's um, that's another way we could implement that idea. Uh, just to use, mate, it's exactly the same firing mechanic, it's the exact same hit event, uh, do damage, and then the AI go, hey, have I taken enough damage? Uh, what happens if you want bullets to damage fabric? Cloth is a system that's built into the engine, but you need to use an external tool called the Apex Cloth Tools in either Maya or 3DS Max to set up the geometry you want to use as cloth. I'm fairly certain that it does support some type of tearing, but I just I haven't done that stuff myself. And I think that um, unless it was a really critical gameplay element that was, you know, a really core primary mechanic for my game, then I would probably try and find some other way to do it or use my energy to focus on something that was going to have a bit more bang for buck. Whereas if you're making something like a cinematic or something like that, well, then I'd understand. Or or a game that's about, you know, having to tear through through fabric and stuff. But the Apex tools will be... Uh, the NVIDIA Apex tools will be the ones that you are looking for for something like that. Um, I'll give you guys a look at one other thing. Um... The remember event graph, you used it to add input functions. Yes, yeah, so um, the event graph is actually responding to the inputs that are set up in the project view. So if we go to project settings, input, these mappings that I've set up, either the binary or the analog ones that I can just give an arbitrary name, in any of the like pawn graphs or really I'm pretty sure I could do it in any actor class but they wouldn't necessarily accept the inputs the pawns are specifically set up in a way that they can take input straight away once they're possessed I just right click in here and I can just type look look up or look right and there are my events right there so I just add them in that way and that's uh, that's that's how they work let's see what else we've got uh, I'll see if that one boots up but in the meantime, um, yeah, so we've covered the basics of creating blueprint functionality within our project, player interaction with a pawn, creating a weapon system, and uh, setting up some dynamic destructions. So if you followed along or you intend to follow along later on, have an absolute blast with it. Um, but do consider other ways that you could use the ideas that we've talked about today. The way that, okay... I know how to spawn something in the world. I know how to give it a location to be spawned at. Uh, I know how to make it have a velocity like a projectile when I create it. You could create a rocket launcher if you wanted to. Um, you could have a thing where you throw out seeds into the world and then they grow into plants or something like that. But just start mulling around those really fundamental concepts that we're playing around with. And... Um, and think of different ways that you might be able to apply them. 
Um, and uh, that should be well and good. Uh, if you have a vehicle and you want it to take damage. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can do this really briefly. I'm not necessarily going to go through this, but the notion of damage in any kind of game is really just a number that's getting passed around. You know about having health, you know about having armor and those things. So let's say that your health and your armor both start out at 100. Whenever a damage event takes place, so like in my case, with that AI stuff, they detect when a... Well, a, the cannonball itself detects when it's hit one of those AI characters, and if it has, it will apply a certain amount of damage. The AI character has a certain amount of health, and when that number gets subtracted, it goes, uh, am I below zero health? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay, so now I'm going to turn on my ragdoll stuff, and I'm going to turn off all of the AI stuff, and I'm just going to fall down on the ground and be dumb limp like a ragdoll. As far as visual damage on a vehicle, um, that's generally achieved through what we call soft body dynamics. And that's not necessarily something that's implemented in this engine right now. But you can do it by detecting where on the surface of an object it's hit. So that hit event that we were using before where we broke that struct open and got the location, the impact normal, the other actor involved, the component, all of that kind of stuff. You could use that to apply a decal or a texture on the surface of the object that was hit, which also includes what we call an offset, a position offset on the uh, geometry itself. So you could say, hey, if you hit me in this location, stamp this texture or material on here, but also push the geometry of the car in and make it look like that panel was dented. Uh, and that would be a really cool kind of fun thing to try and do. Hopefully that, that answers your question a little bit. Um, this is an example of something slightly different that you guys might find interesting. While I was going through the Canon tutorial, I decided that I, I, I don't know, I saw Mad Max and I decided that I wanted to create a catapult that had a Doof Warrior. So what we have here is uh, a series of, well, fairly ropey, but fully physically simulated catapults that are launching these things out into the world. And they have fairly sad looking Doof Warriors on them. Um, but I just was, I was just such a bonkers part of that movie that I'm like, I need to prove that I can do this. Um, so you can see that the, the, the cannonballs themselves don't necessarily play terribly nicely with the physics, uh, in here because it's just quite a lot to ask them to do. When the, there's actually a physical impulse being applied to this, uh, fulcrum part of the cannon arm that's throwing it forward. The wheels are attached with physics, and he's obviously attached with physics as well. So the whole thing can kind of, look at that, look at it sort of jump up and react like that. And that was the idea, was that he would float around and be kind of crazy. Um, you can see that there's a constraint on him that he's uh, that's being used. And so yeah, physically simulated catapult might not be the best idea. But you can see him responding as I move it around, that he's kind of bouncing around and all that kind of good stuff. And those cannons are, well, to some degree, they're doing exactly the same thing as the player ones did. But at the moment, they're just not quite making it. it I think if the frame rate gets too low for them, they don't get thrown as far. But um, but yeah, so I thought you guys might enjoy that little tidbit. And, uh, oh, hang on, let's get back out of that. And uh, yeah, so if there are any other questions, I would very much like to hear them. And pretty much anything at all. Um, I'll put the uh, contact details for AIE Online up again if you guys are interested. But if you're all bored and want to go home, that's fine too. I'm going to infer from the silence that people are bored and want to go home, or they're busy playing around with blueprints. Uh, I really hope that this has been interesting, uh, hopefully a little bit inspirational for you, and giving you a little bit of a window into what can be achieved very quickly uh, in terms of using this engine and using the blueprint editor and that kind of a thing. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, and uh, it's been fun for me. Hope it's been fun for you. Have yourselves a good one. Cheers. Bye. Uh, 
uh, I don't know if we're still going, but there was a question that came through. Can you trigger an animation where a projectile hits? It depends on what you want the animation to be triggered on, um, whether you want it to be triggered on the projectile or on the thing that it hits. You absolutely positively can. You could detect that the uh, uh, cannonball had hit the, uh, let's say the AI character that I set up that has a skeleton on it. Uh, we could use that moment to tell that AI character, play this animation now. And it could be a, you know, a death animation you've created or a jump or anything you wanted. Uh, basically, you can hang any type of functionality that you want off of that hit event. And um, if, uh, uh, if you want it to spawn a particle system, you do that the same way that you've spawned the uh, projectile. It's actually the exact same node. You would give it a location, which you would get from the hit event, and bam, you can have sparks appear, or you could um, you know, have a, a, some other effect. You could have lighting change or anything you want to. So that's the power of an event-based system like this. You can kind of think about it in a way that you, okay, when this happens, what do I want to have happen? I know what the cause is, what's the consequence, you know? Uh, this thing's hit this other thing, or this much time has passed. Uh, I was thinking like a drop of water hitting a seed, which could grow. Okay, so, um, absolutely. In that case, the drop of water itself would uh, come into contact with the seed and confer or share some kind of property with the seed. So it would say, add an arbitrary number like 10, add 10 water to this seed. So the seed itself would be constantly making some kind of check as to, do I have enough water to grow? Uh, if I have enough water to grow, I will continue to grow. There would be another variable, that's how much I've grown. Um, but it would really be a case of, the water passing its property of amount of water, which would just be a number, to the seed itself. And the seed would be constantly trying to grow, but only if it had enough water. And that's a really excellent question. I really like that idea. Um, that you have to kind of tend a garden and make sure that it grows for some cool reason. Um, and indeed, I think... Uh, if you were saying, can you trigger an animation where a projectile hits in that context, the it wouldn't necessarily need to be a projectile at all. You could just have a normal object or you could potentially do it with a particle system, but I'm not sure about the interaction between particle collisions and and the regular collision system. I'm not sure if there's a, a really robust communication there, but in terms of being able to have your seed grow into a plant, you could create an animation in your art package that is essentially the entire growth of that plant from seed to fully grown plant. Or you could have what we call morph targets, which are essentially, you know, let's say there are three stages of growth. Uh, your geometry could be in the seed form, the partially grown form, and the fully grown form. And you can animate a blend between those based upon that level of growth that I was talking about that the seed has. So if it had 10%, it would be, you know, 10% of the way to being fully grown, and it would be blending between those three different versions of the mesh, those three morph targets, uh, to demonstrate that it had grown. And likewise, if it lost moisture, uh, moisture, if it needed to ungrow for some reason, you could drive that morph in the other direction and have it kind of atrophy a little bit or you could create another morph target that is it kind of curled up and dry and dead and it would slowly blend to that over time if it didn't have enough water so that sounds like a really awesome idea it would probably require looking into just a couple of different things to do with you know how the materials and the, and the textures and stuff work in Unreal because they use the materials to drive those morph targets uh, and it's really powerful but you might normally think that you could just access that completely separate to the material that's been applied to them. But, you know, that's how that's how I've known it to be done within the engine. There might be better ways. Um, so you'd need to familiarize yourself with that. 
some of the blueprint communication stuff um, as well as knowing how to set up an entity like that that has a need for water it has a water variable and it has a growth amount so that's actually a relatively simple thing that you could set up you just need to think about how often you need to be checking certain parts of that how often you want to check how much water's there how often you want to uh, add to the amount of growth do you want to do it every second do you want to do it every half a minute or something like that um, but yeah, so that's the kind of long-winded explanation for, yes, that's a cool idea, and I think you should do it, and it's very doable. Cool. Well, I think that I will let you guys go now. Thank you very much once again for joining, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing the awesome things that you create at the back of this. Have fun with it, guys. Keep creating things. Peace.